Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's gospel lesson from Luke chapter 12 continues the theme that we've heard so much this Advent season, that of preparedness and urgency and expectation. Jesus says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. That is how we, as Christ's disciples, are to wait for his return. Our waists are to be girded. In the ancient Near East, men wore long, flowing robes that weren't really made for activity, for quick movements, but you could fix that quickly by girding your loins, by pulling up the robe a bit and fastening a belt or a rope around your waist. That's how the Israelites were to eat the Passover in Exodus chapter 12. The Lord said they were to eat the Passover with a belt around your waist, sandals on your feet, and a staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste. This girding, though, that Christ speaks of today isn't a physical preparation of our dress, though, because no one dresses like that anymore, except the pastor, during the services of the church. <coughs> Excuse me. Christians don't gird themselves physically, but spiritually and mentally. St. Peter says in his first epistle, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So now, during these days in our flesh, we gird up the loins of our minds with the fact that Christ is returning at some point, and that when he returns, St. Peter says, he brings grace and every blessing to those who believe in him, for those who have waited for him patiently in faith. That's the second part, then, of Jesus' words today. He says, let your lamps be burning. That is, to hold the fire of faith within our hearts by hearing God's word, by receiving his sacrament, so that our faith is strengthened, so that our faith endures into the end. Or if we don't feed that, with the oil, our, that flame with the oil of faith, then our faith will simply slacken, will weak, weaken, dim, and grow cold. So with waists girded, lamps burning, we are to be ready for the return of the Master. And as we wait for him to return from the clouds, Jesus then shows us today and reminds us as his Christians that his return is one of blessing for us. He says, Blessed are those servants whom the Master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And what a blessing. This is the blessing this will be, that their Lord and Master, when he arrives, whenever that may be, will enter the house that he will gird himself and that he will serve them in his heavenly kingdom. This is the opposite of how things work in the world. This is the twist of the kingdom of heaven. This is as Jesus said about his earthly ministry in Matthew chapter 20. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Christ's ministry while on earth, Christ's ministry here in the church, is one of service towards sinners. It's service towards sinners in his earthly life in that he graciously forgave their sins, removing the heavy burden of their sins by atoning for their sins and the sins of the entire world upon the cross. His ministry of service continues in the church where he daily and richly forgives the sins of all believers in his holy Christian church. But he tells us that when he returns, even though he won't return in lowliness and meekness and gentleness as his first advent, even though he comes to judge the quick and the dead, yet, even then, for those who have been patiently waiting for him, that will still be a service, a ministry of service. For he will then gird himself and serve us with all of the heavenly blessings of peace and joy that he has promised. It will be as David says in the 23rd Psalm. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. When Christ returns for all who have waited for him, he will prepare a feast like that that Isaiah describes in his 25th chapter. A feast of choice pieces, of wine on the leaves, of fat things full of merit. So shall be the celebration that Christ invites us to when he returns to celebrate the end of death and the destruction of sin, and the remembrance of guilt. To this, 
the Apostle Peter then asks, Lord, do you speak this parable to us only or to all people? Peter wants to know if this applies only to the twelve or whether it applies to all those who believe in Christ. And so Christ responds. He says, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. So Jesus' words here aren't just for the apostles. They're not just for ministers, although it is, it is true, as we heard on Sunday, that this is how one should think of us as stewards of Christ, or servants of Christ, rather, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Here Jesus casts a wider net to include all who believe in him. Because after all, all Christians are stewards of the good and gracious gifts that he's given to us. Pastors are stewards of the mysteries of God, his word and sacraments. But everything that you have is a stewardship from God as well. Everything we have in this life is a gift for what, did you, what do you have that you did not receive from him? He gives us possessions to enjoy, but also to use for the benefits of others. He gives us our vocations, our callings, as parents, grandparents, child, citizen, employee, volunteer, husband, wife, and many others. Not for our personal pleasure, but for the service of those around us. Our talents, our powers, our abilities, everything is to be used for the benefit of those around us. For this is what he shares with us in the parable. The steward is to give them their portion of food in due season. The opposite is to hoard the gifts of God. The opposite is to take advantage of them, to use them only for oneself. It's to be that wicked servant who begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and be drunk. The wicked servant takes no thought to the fact that his master returns, will return one day. He gives no thought to the fact that he'll have to give an account for that stewardship. He lives only for himself. That wicked servant, Jesus says, will be cut into two pieces and cast out with the unbelievers in hell. Even the servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself according to his will shall be beat with many stripes, he says, again in the pangs of hell. Why? For Jesus says, for everyone who has much, everyone of whom much is given, excuse me, from him much more will be required, and to, him, and to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. Such is how we are to fulfill and strive to fulfill our stewardships, not just enjoying the things of this life, but to use them to benefit those that God has given us around us. Finally, our Lord Jesus then tells us what kind of world we will live in as we wait for his return with our waists girded, our lamps burning as we fulfill our stewardships. And he says that it's not going to be an easy one. In fact, he describes about the worst possible situation that any of us could imagine. The trouble that we encounter in this life, he says, is trouble on the account of Christ. He says, I came to send fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. The baptism of which he speaks is his suffering and his death, and the fire which he comes to throw down upon the earth, it's the offense of the cross. Sinners don't want to hear that they are unworthy of everlasting life because of their sins, because they treasure their sins. People don't want to be told that they're sinners, and they most certainly don't want to hear that God's Son has earned the forgiveness of their sins, and will gladly forgive all of them who repent of those sins and flee to him for mercy. Most of them would try rather to make satisfaction for their own sins. Most of them want to earn back God's favor with their own works, even though they owe their good works to God already. Still others seek to earn God's favor with self-castigation and self-flagellation. Now the offense of the cross, it does not bring peace, as many imagine. It brings division so the countries, societies, but most of all, even families are divided against one another. So the father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. For even thus in the smallest of households, there will be division, not for the sake of division, but division on account of Christ. This world which is terribly divided over who Christ is and what Christ does for us upon the cross, is the world in which we are called to wait, to gird our loins, 
and to look to the heavens for Christ's return. We're not called to fix on that division, nor are we called to grouse about it, but we're called to be faithful in the midst of it. Waists girded, lamps burning, fulfilling our stewardships, no matter how large or how small they may seem. As St. Peter says, rest your hope fully on the grace and blessing to be revealed in Christ Jesus when he returns. For our hope is not in this life, but in the life of the world to come. Be faithful and wise in your vocations, living each day as stewards of God's good things that he has given to you. Use your gifts and your blessings for the sake of those around you and to the glory of God and the spread of his gospel as he gives you an opportunity. Live, as Jesus says here, as men who wait for their master to return home from the wedding, so that whenever he comes, he may find you ready. Jesus gives us this great promise by which we are to live today. He tells us that all who wait with their lamps burning, with their waists girded, being faithful stewards of what God has given them, be it great or small, he says, blessed is that servant whom the master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. Those who are faithful until the end will be saved. Those who endure in true faith will rule with Christ in paradise and there enjoy all the heavenly blessings of his internal benefits, those that he promises to give to those who love him and eagerly await it. Do not fret about the division that we see that Christ has brought through his gospel. Do not fret at the problems and the pains of your stewardships which he has so graciously given to you, but rather wait. Gird your loins, both of your mind and your heart, looking for his coming. For those who look, those who watch, those who wait for him faithfully, our Lord calls that one blessed. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which far surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.